Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Check one, two, three, check one, two, three. Am I audible to everyone at the back? Okay. First of all, I'm going to start off with a couple of apologies. A lot of what we heard from former Deputy Prime Minister Clegg resonates with me, but I come from a very different background. I come from a background where I saw the 1987 crash one mile away from where I was teaching portfolio managers in Boston. And I saw the 95 crash from IMF where Mexican peso was crashing. So a lot of my research has to do with crises and advising governments on how to avoid crises and what can we learn from one crisis or the other. I will apologize first of all for challenging all of you and me because I will highlight what economists got wrong. He highlighted what politicians got wrong. I will highlight what central bankers got wrong, actuaries got wrong, and I will appeal to all of you for one thing that I'm only very passionate about. I said that yesterday in Amsterdam to the biggest pension funds 10 days ago in Norway. We need to collectively put aside our differences, understand the world of pensions and investments with assets, liabilities, and the macro environment in a very, very joined up, integrated fashion. Otherwise, we run the risk, and I quote Aldous Huxley, of not being able to reach a brave new world, we will really fail because we will lack the courage to reach a brave new world. So my appeal to all of you is, Think out of the box, think collectively, but I will also share with you what every insurance company, every pension fund, every individual in the world got wrong with very, very simple numbers. Very simple, and I'm one of those who contributed to that through teaching my students, through practicing, and so I really apologize for being provocative, but second, I'm also going to apologize because I walk around the auditorium. I haven't spoken behind a podium in the last 15 years. I'm supposed to at the biggest education conference in Dubai where they say 7,000 people, you can't walk between them, but here I'm going to walk. So first of all, let me pay tribute. We are in Edinburgh to the biggest Scottish economist of the last 50 years. Does anyone know who he is? For the last six years, I've been going around the world, more than 70 countries, singing his laurels. But many of you think of a French economist called Thomas Piketty, who's my generation, but you really need to think about the best Scottish economist who could have answered a lot of the problems that Nick Clegg, Cameron, etc., faced. His name, ladies and gentlemen, is Angus Deaton, Nobel laureate, expert in inequality, consumption, welfare, and health. All you need to do is see how simply he talks about these issues in a book called The Great Escape. So demographics. When I started doing demographics 18 years ago, I didn't know how to spell it. So I went and looked it up in the English lexicon, and it comes from two roots. Demos, which is people, graphos, which is characteristics. Nowhere was there a mention of the word age. Yet every economist, every actuary, Every politician jumps the gun and tends to associate unilaterally the word demographics with age. So to me, the biggest thing that I think about demographics that you need to know is it's about people characteristics. Demos is people, graphos is characteristics. And what are the most important characteristics of all of you sitting in this room? From the time you're born till the date you die, you're consumers. Consumption is 70% of the world GDP. Also, all of you are workers. How many consumers are there in the world? A baby born in Edinburgh General is a consumer, so is a 114-year-old woman in Okinawa, Japan. They're consuming very different things. All of you are workers. We have about 5.1 billion workers in the world. They make up the GDP. So stop thinking about age, because even if, let's assume, that Richard, I, and Nick are the same age, we are very different. I'm an immigrant, they are natives. They went to private schools, I went to a public school. My father's a butcher, maybe his father's a lawyer, and his father's an entrepreneur. Women are different than men, yet all of economics and finance and actuarial science, what do we try to do? We try to 
put ourselves in a very good situation, what would the super rational person do? What would supercomputer one do as if all of us are super rational? So we really need to understand those differences. And here's the reason why it matters for investments. Take it from me as a finance professor who's linked demographics to discount rates, real estate, asset prices, inflation, inequality, sustainability, that consumers and workers affect income statement and balance sheet for households, individuals, corporates, and nations. And that's why I want to preface it by telling you that somebody much smarter than me, 50 times smarter than me, and maybe smarter than some of you, considered the biggest management guru of 20th century, Peter Drucker had the following thing to say in management challenges for 21st century. Demographics is the single most important factor that we do not pay attention to, yet when we do pay attention, we miss the point. Ladies and gentlemen, all of you missed the point because I will show you on the next slide a big mistake that we made. So since 2000, I was doing demographics, and in 2007, I went to present in Netherlands where the head of the Dutch Health Association tells me that an 80-year-old person in Netherlands cost their government 79% more than a 65-year-old. In Switzerland, it's more than 90%. In US, it's more than double. And what do we do? We take everyone in this population in actuarial models, economic and policy models, and say, you're either a young non-worker, 0 to 15, 16 to 64, you're a worker, or 65 plus, you're a retiree. What I'm showing you here is the world population. The fastest growing world population segment is the 80 plus. They've grown by 400% over the last 45 years when the whole world population grew by 100%. In Japan, the 80 plus population was 1%. Debt to GDP was 46%. Now it's 8%. Debt to GDP is 260%. The single biggest reason for Japan's public finance and public debt problem. It's not just happening in Japan, it's happening in Singapore, where the 80 plus population has increased by 1,971% over 45 years in Hong Kong, where it's increased by 3,900%. So we really need to understand the very old population are much more expensive than the 65-year-olds. They are growing the fastest, and the blunder every insurance company and all of us made is we treated all retirees from 65 to 70 to 75 to 80 to 85 in one blanket category. Why? because it suited economists and actuaries like me who could do very convenient math with three generations. Converted to four or five generations, a lot of our math fails. So this is the paper I wrote in 2006 showing how life cycles are changing, zero to five, five to 18, 18 to 25. So five to 18, we have more tech savvy people, increased years in education, zero to five, more socialization, more exposure to digital and TV, Delayed entry into the labor market. But look here, 65 to 80, increase in longevity, increase in wealth, increase in travel, leisure, and luxury. Now let me tell you another mistake. This is investments. I told you about macro. Look at a mistake that we as finance professors taught. In finance, in savings and pensions, 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, every fund manager in US, UK, et cetera, was told, focus on the middle-aged people people between 40 to 59. Yet today, the richest age group in the world, in the G10, is 65 to 74 year olds. Do you know why? Because the two best decades in 200 years of asset returns were 1981 to 2000. Anyone who's 35 or 40 in 1981 had a quadruple bonus. Equities went up, bonds went up, real estate went up, and GDP per capita went up. So we have now five to six life cycles that many people are kind of living. And we really need to think about this because this changes the whole understanding of income, of work, of consumption. So remember, pensions is not just about retirees. You start building pensions from the time you're consuming and over the life cycle. So let me give you a challenging question. 91-year-old retiree in Omskirk, just outside uh, just outside Wigan, close to Wigan, has a son in Manchester, 67. 67-year-old has a 45-year-old daughter who has a 21-year-old daughter with six-month-old twins. Five generations exist. 
two generations of retirees. In Netherlands yesterday in Amsterdam, everyone nodded at the CIO summit because they said we are seeing 70% with five generations. In Mexico, four to five generations is 48%. And yet you're pressing F9 on three generation models and doing your asset allocation, assuming that it's only one generation of retiree. The 91 year old says, who do I give the money to? To the 66 year old, 67 year old, 45 year old, 22 year old, or to the six month olds. Throw out of the window all the models that we teach in economics that I taught and I'm guilty of. Also they say, who do we spend time with? If we spend time with the 67 year old, they say, why haven't you given us all your wealth? Whereas when we spend time with the six month or one year old, we feel we've contributed to five generations. So we really need to think about all these things which are changing. Look here, even UK is not homogeneous, neither is France, Italy, Germany. So I'm showing you fertility rate changes here in terms of England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. Life expectancy, old age dependency ratio, and the total population, very, very different. Let me give you a very stark example. Biggest pension fund or sovereign wealth fund in the world, I took their life tables in Norway and I said, let's replace them with the Danish life tables. The surplus ratio went from 104% to 96%. Likewise, if I take England's life tables and I replace them with Wales or Scotland, I'm going to get very, very different results. Yet most of you just try to look at all of UK. So we need to understand these heterogeneous differences across all of UK. Now, what are the changes in life? Men and women are getting married later. The life expectancy of women is much higher than that of men. They are having children later too. And tomorrow is International Women's Day. I'm really passionate about the fact that we care about everything on planet Earth except being fair towards women. Women outlive men by roughly four years in the G20. There are more university graduates in UK who are women than men, yet we pay them roughly 50% lower than men. And in Japan, we pay men 130% more. In the Nordic countries, it's hardly 15 to 20%. They want to reduce the gender gap even further. So if we really call ourselves an egalitarian, a concerned, and a fair society, then in the context of a brave new world, or I must cite, I must cite since I'm here in Edinburgh, Adam Smith, in theory of moral sentiments, he did talk about how do we share the wealth in a capitalist society across consumers and workers. Now look here, what's happening? Share of the 80 plus. It's increased, but not uniform across all parts of England. 5.3% is the share of the 80 plus in Wales, very different than Northern Ireland where it's 4.1%. The 65 plus is also different. And I don't like always looking at the centenarians because they are a very small portion. Looking at centenarians to me is sometimes looking at a very, very wealthy uh, sub-segment or a very well-educated sub-segment. They are very important, but for me, I prefer the common folks. Let's look at the demographic manifesto. This was what I wrote in 2000. 47 governments highlight this for changing retirement age. Number one, abolish mandatory retirement if you want to get rid of the demographics time bomb. Adopt flexible retirement. Second, in 2000, we told the French and the Japanese government, close the gender gaps to better utilize work potential. Rethink immigration policies and outsource. Let's see how far we've come. Look here, in Korea, Mexico, New Zealand, Switzerland, uh, Japan, Turkey, and even parts of Sweden, we've got effective retirement age when people retire longer or later than official retirement ages. Same here, no one's holding a gun to their head. Why? Because if I were to ask you a simple question, Richard says, Amlan, you're going to retire at 65, and Rachel has got the best longevity model. She says you'll die when you're 85. Best actuaries in the world, I've tested this in lots of conferences, more than 1,000. How many, wh what amount of money do I need for 20 years post-retirement? No one can answer. We don't know healthcare costs. We don't know inflation. We don't know taxes. We don't know living status. You don't know where I'm going to retire. If I retire in Tokyo versus retiring in a province much further off, which is cheaper, then my money could last much longer. So we really need to think of those issues. Look then at employment by sectors. Employment by sectors is also 
quite different between France, Germany, and UK. But we tend to think, oh, all the European countries are very similar. We need to understand the fact that the structure of GDP is very different. Unemployment rates of females, native born versus foreign born. And what I want to show you is turquoise is native born, foreign born unemployment rates in Italy, France, Germany are higher, but in UK and US, they aren't higher. Look how fair UK and US are. So there are big differences across um, countries that we need to understand. This is the gender point I was making. In Italy, 19% difference between males and females. In UK, the difference is 12%. In Nordic countries, this gap is 12, 13%. And look at how much we pay. These have been rounded up, but UK and US is 50% more for, uh, women, uh, for men rather than women. Then I take you to growth. The biggest thing we need to understand on the asset side to understand savings and consumers is growth. And this is an ECB model which says growth comes from three components. Working age population growth, how many workers in the age group grew. How did productivity increase, labor productivity, real GDP by hours work, and how many hours did we work? So let's assume that all these countries are very similar. What I'm showing you here is roughly 26 years of GDP declines across all these countries, US, Japan, UK, Germany. And the main reason for decline in growth is this component called labor productivity growth. Everywhere labor productivity has gone down in 71 countries that have analyzed. China, India, Brazil, etc. This is not labor productivity level, labor productivity growth. Who has the highest labor productivity growth in this room? Not Richard and Amlan, for sure. It's the youngest people who are 23, 24, 25 in a company because it is growth. And therefore, to get higher growth in the world, we really need to employ more young people and more women. I argue my generation has failed. We failed to create jobs for young people, thought they will have happen automatically because the baby boomers had it very easy. How to create jobs? We really need to think harder and think for generations of society when we want to create these jobs and think about how technology and migration has played a part. This is UK wage growth and household savings. Look at savings, savings dipping in a way. All the wage growth out here is going up. So what does this in indicate? This indicates we are not planning well enough for our future. Then I show you how savings differs across different age groups. If you're less than 30, wages and salaries are 76% of your income. But if you're greater than 75, you get roughly 36% for private pensions, and your cash benefits out here are 50%. So there's a big difference across age groups that we really need to think about, and most of us have not looked at 65 to 74 and 75 plus in that way. Now this is the, my pet peeve, why is Europe unsustainable and nearly broke? In Europe, if you get 100 euros, nearly 73% goes on old age, sickness, healthcare, and disability. This is unsustainable. In UK, roughly about 16% goes on pensions, healthcare, long-term care, and by 2060, it's projected to go up to 20%. In EU, it is already 20%, and it's expected to go up to 23%. According to me, this is unsustainable in every country, unless the younger generation agrees to come out of university and pay minimum 80% taxes. Is that the kind of change we want? Then I'm showing you immigration. Look at Germany. Everyone talks about immigration being similar across countries. I'm a data geek who's showing you the data that in Germany, deaths were greater than births from 1973 onwards. Only the red bars, which is immigration, this point is 1973. Somewhere in making the PDF, the axes have gone out here. But you can see that Germany population has been decreasing in natural terms. Only immigration keeps it positive. Then look at UK. Immigration today accounts for roughly about 48%. It was about 56% 10 years ago. In France, you can see it's much lower. So immigration is very different in terms of patterns across France, Germany, as well as UK. Furthermore, when you look at national and international immigration, there's big differences between in England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. 
These charts show the data. I just want to give you the pattern, that the patterns are very different. We cannot jump from one conclusion saying England is the same as Wales. Yeah. Sure. I'll, I'll wrap up in about four minutes. So education. Let's look at education. And again, I want to pay tribute to what the UK does. So look at UK. Foreign-born, highly educated share is 47% compared to 35% for the natives. No other country it is so. This is liberal, open United Kingdom. And on immigration, I have the following thing to say. I failed UK on its immigration policies for last 20 years. And I've been saying it. US, Norway, Sweden the same way. Because no one's asked the right questions. Why do we need immigrants? How many immigrants? What's the cost? What's the benefit? Do we need short term? Do we need long term immigrants? Can women job share and do some of the jobs? If you do not ask those questions, you do not understand the costs and benefits. And I did write a paper looking at 400 years of immigration, showing how France is different than UK, U, uh, US, and Germany. If you want, you can take a look at it. Next point is, again, structure of GDP. In UK, the openness is 56%, which is exports plus imports by GDP. In Germany, it's 86%. In Belgium, it's 164%. But in US, it's 28%. Consumption to GDP in UK is 65%, but in Netherlands only 45%. In US, it's 68%. So don't just look at GDP, which most of you look at in investments, but ask yourself, where is the GDP coming from? China wants 50% or more of its GDP to come domestically. Currently, only about 36% comes domestically. This is on exports and imports, that we are still very dependent on our European partners. Many of you know, but so are France and Germany. Then I want to show you consumption by age group. Very, very different when you look at consumption by age group of the 65 to 74 or the 75 plus. They are spending a lot more on food, a lot less on housing, a lot more on health care. And we need to understand these differences because the consumer companies like Google, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, Marks & Spencers are trying to understand it. Yet with all the data, we are not doing as much of it in uh, investments. I will skip this slide. Here is what I want to show you. One of the least generous pension systems in the world is United Kingdom. You can see 3.6 versus the G6. And this is what Lord Adair Turner in his Pensions Commission report highlighted. And we are still worse because our savings are going down and this hasn't increased. We really need to find ways of motivating savings using some behavioral economics, using some correct policies, and trying and understanding the consumers and workers better. This is my second last slide, which shows sectors that we are bullish on. Pharma and biotech, number one sector. Number two sector is financial services. And I will quote Larry Fink and myself in a pensions conference in US in 2016 saying the same thing. Less than 30% of the products we need in 2030 for pensions and retirement exist today. So the challenge is to all of us to create those products because an 80-year-old laborer needs a very different product than an 80-year-old professor or an 80-year-old doctor. The third sector we are bullish on is leisure and luxury, growing inequality in the world. Fourth and fifth are infrastructure and natural resources. Mostly US needs a lot of infrastructure. Their roads, airports, as well as other structures seem to be crumbling more than other countries. Then I, this is my last slide on asset allocation. This is where finance went wrong, and you people are still pressing F9 on the buttons of models we built in the 60s and 70s. Markowitz, Sharp Lintner, et cetera, all these models are based on three asset classes. Pasta, which is public equities, pizza, which is government bonds, and water, which is cash. Look at what's happening in the pension system now in Netherlands, 1% of alternatives, which is real estate, infrastructure, commodities, hedge funds, has gone to 14%. UK has gone from 10 to 16, US from 5 to 27, and GPIF CIO says they've gone from 2 to 10, but they want 10% to be just the private equity allocation, because in a world where we have seen QE fail and central banking policy has been ineffective because old people don't borrow, they are very rich, and under QE and credit regulation, you don't want to lend money to the younger people. So I'm in the camp of John Taylor, uh, Phil Turner, as well as James Bullard saying, 
central bankers have assumed supernatural powers, yet they have not succeeded. We need a lot more of fiscal policy and structural policies to see growth return. And I ultimately conclude by saying, when you look at asset allocation, you have to look at inflation risk, interest rate risk, longevity risk, and market risk, and demographics affects all the drivers of growth, inflation, debt, and asset returns. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. So I was exhausted just listening to all of that. <laughs> The first time it's like that. <laughs> <laughs> Amlan delivers these speeches. He told me uh, in conversation before the event that he travels to over 30 countries a year uh, speaking at conferences. Now, I counted up. I've only ever been to 36 countries, so that's pretty impressive. Right, anybody got any questions? We are rapidly running out of time, so they will have to be very, very brief. Um, I'm going to go to one then straight on the app because I think this is a really interesting question. So I'm going to read it out verbatim. Don't these figures show that we're in a post-growth world? Isn't the challenge about accepting what we'll, that we'll be materially poorer and working out how we'll be happy in that state? Outstanding question. So what I missed, and I'm happy to, yesterday I was talking to Dutch CIOs on ESG, sustainability, growth, etc. So I want to give you four metrics that I show across all the countries. Number one, human development index, quality of growth. Where's UK? UK is 15. Gender, where's UK? UK is again 15. Sustainability, we are about 12th. And in corruption perception index, we are 10th. So we are not doing as bad as US and lots of countries which are richer than us. So it's important looking at quality of life. It's important looking at a fairer society because millennials aren't just running after money. They want more meaning. They also want to kind of do jobs which satisfy them a lot more. So yes, growth will be low, but it doesn't necessarily have to be low. If we are fairer towards women and young people, then already some parts of China, some parts of India, and emerging markets are showing that growth can happen. And I argued in, in one of the articles which got covered in The Economist three years ago, US can grow at 3% if it starts being fairer towards women and also easing up on the work level. Americans live eight years less than, on average, median age than the Germans or Japanese. Why? Because they're supersized, they are the most obese country in the world, they are health inefficient, and if somebody wants to take three weeks vacation, they think they are really shirking. Whereas if you went to the Nordic countries, somebody takes three weeks, they think they really need to have the head examined. So yes, <laughs> we really need to move away from just growth metrics to more quality of life metrics. Okay, so room for one? Yes, sir. There. Oh, good spot. Microphone's just coming to you. Again, if you can tell us who you are, and I'm afraid that's gonna be the last one. Thank you, Zuhir Mohammed from LCP. Quick question, should we invest in the areas where pensioners actually spend their money? Brilliant question. Yes, I believe and I argue, I've written papers on this, in China, in Japan, in Switzerland, in Norway, the governments are trying to target areas like biotechnology for healthcare, for MSME, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, better living conditions for old people, better education for the young people. It cannot just be for the pensioners, it has to be across the generations. Because if you went and asked the 90-year-old Japanese people, they say we are willing to pay 20% of our healthcare costs provided you take some of it and give it to the younger people. So we need, I argue, we cannot solve the pensions problem in the world. In a paper, please Google that paper, how increasing longevity affects us all. It's a speech I gave to 43 Asian governments on lessons to be learned from mistakes of the West. Number one, can't solve the pensions problem by itself. You need to solve labor, health, pensions and social policy along with education holistically because if you tell me I have to come and work when I'm 70s or 80s, then he has to be willing to also employ me. Otherwise, he's saying, oh, why hire Amlan? He speaks too much. He's so expensive. And I can hire two younger people from Edinburgh. But in Japan, people are working part-time, part-year, part-week. And we really need to create the whole ethos whereby health is paramount, education, lifelong skills, and investing in sectors for pensions. So I, I can't say whether you cost too much. We haven't discussed fee yet. Um, certainly you talk quite a lot, and, and it's quite unnerving when you get off the stage. But, you know, apart from that. Okay, that's all we've got time for. I'm really sorry. But uh, um, 
Amland's going to be hanging around the State Street stand for the full conference or just today? All around the conference, State Street and here. So, so thank you very grab much. Grab them if you like. Well done, thank you. Is that okay?